Hi, I'm Ken Crawford, president of the Alaska Conference, and I want to show you around my Alaska. I love it here. This is not the end of the world, but it's pretty close. I love Alaska. It's the greatest adventure you could ever imagine. If you want to find out more, go to our website, alaskaconference.org, and you'll find all kinds of information and stories on what Alaska is like. There's a constant collision between civilization and nature because we live next to each other. There's a feeling of remoteness. Not isolation, but remoteness. There is a vastness in the wilderness in Alaska. The mountains are more majestic. Nature is undisputed master. There's something about this country that sets off in me a craving for heaven. The living conditions are a challenge, I can tell you. But the needs in Alaska far outweigh the challenges of living here. This is one big place. Unbelievable. Alaska is the largest state. I can't believe the vastness of this part of our country. 230 Arctic villages and only 10 of them have been entered by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You know, the work isn't going to be finished anywhere until it's finished everywhere, and that includes these Arctic villages. There is absolutely no presence of our Adventist Church. Something has to be done. We need a plan. These are great people. These people have lived here for centuries. Because these villages are so remote, they're very closed societies. And it's very difficult to enter those villages unless we have some way to, to uh, reach into the village itself. I've never heard of the Seventh-day Adventist Church because the village where I was born and raised, we don't have a Seventh-day Adventist Church. Without anybody here, nothing happens. We've got about 3,800 members in all of Alaska, about 2,000 active members in the whole state. And most of those members are concentrated in the area where we've got half of our population. Over 50% of our population are in the Anchorage area, the Anchorage Bowl area. And so the rest of it is very vast, very remote, and those are the areas that are very difficult to reach. There are so many people in the outreaches of the villages that don't even know the gospel yet and need to be reached. We have a big, big, big challenge and because of the hugeness of the state. There's no way that uh, the small nucleus of people can uh, do this task, so we, we really need some outside help. Are you missionary minded? Do you have an adventuresome spirit? We'd love to have you come to Alaska and be a missionary and work with the folks here. We have 230 native villages that are unentered. We need you to come and help us. After 9-11, when my family and I realized that Jesus was coming soon, we wanted to be involved in mission. Through a chain of circumstances that we saw that God was leading, we were led to begin mission work in Selawik, Alaska, a small village above the Arctic Circle. During that time we were there, we learned about the, the need for radio and we felt impressed that God was calling us to use radio as a way of reaching out to people all across Alaska. There's so many villages, we thought, well, how can we do this? How can we you know, reach out to the large number of people scattered all over Alaska? And so radio on a small scale, individual small low power FM transmitters is our key. Now, when I first began this project, we got a, a little low power transmitter. At first, we had them outside of a box, and then we decided to put them inside a kit. This is using an ammo can, ammo kit, ammo box, and we power it with this little touch screen computer here. The computer itself is is actually quite small. You can see right there. And then transmitter is right here in the second layer. And then underneath that we have power supplies and and that all feeds to three connections on the outside here. 
we have Ethernet, the antenna going out, and the power coming in. This should make it possible for someone to walk into a village with one of these cans, plug in the power cord, set up an antenna, and plug in the Ethernet and have a functioning low power FM radio station. It only costs less than $500 to put one of these systems together and maybe another $500 to fly out into a village and set it up. I'd like you to meet Brian Abraham in Togiak. There was a huge storm and um, ruined my TV situation. I couldn't watch TV for two weeks and my, my only um, entertainment was at radio and um, KDLG, was, I didn't like KDLG because of the uh, static version of it. But then I'm glad there was an FM station that got me hooked. 105.3 Arctic Circle changed my life. I got so mad though at first. I couldn't, you know, I put it, put it back on. But then I believe that God doesn't um, change you complete like this, but he works on you bit by bit. So I did that bit by bit. Now I respect Saturday. You know, it's, it's the truth. Perhaps you could fundraise, bake sales, whatever, and raise that thousand dollars and help us put a radio station in the village. Perhaps you'd like to help us blanket that village with literature. Whatever way that you want to help, we would be very thankful. I'm the school board chair here at Amazing Grace Academy. And for this project, we're trying something a little bit new. Instead of just licking stamps and mailing letters or maybe even talking to people in person, we're trying this internet. Get a gym, get a gym, that is what we need With a floor and a roof and walls between A place for the kids to run and play When the wind might carry them away First it snows and it blows and it snows some more Then the temperature drops 25 below And the kids are wound up and they start to scream Oh cheer! What will it be? A drink, get your coat and your gloves And your scarf and your head stoke pants With long johns underneath Hurry up, getting dressed, just took a pack Your recess time, oh hurry please Never mind, the wind is blowing too hard And we're scared you'll freeze to death Back inside, so goes off to the basement Never mind, your recess time is up Stop moaning, stop crying We're working a solution here by next year we hope to raise some money for a gym. Keep your doubt, keep your fear, no one worried here. With God on our side, nothing to fear. He'll provide the cash. We are sure of this, and our effort we will persist. Be advised, nothing is impossible. With God on our side, Bible tells me so. In a year, you will see we will have a place for children to run and race. As you can see, the kids absolutely have a great time outside, but uh, there are many times they can't go outside. It's either too cold. Uh, we get warnings from the city or the state that it is hazardous uh, to play out there. Sometimes the weather is really atrocious, even by our standards. What do you do when it's minus 20 with 60 mile an hour winds? We need a gymnasium here. It's really hard to do calisthenics in your classroom with your tables and your chairs and your books sitting all over. We've gone from four kids to uh, 75 kids in our school and and the need of a gymnasium is growing and growing. Get the kids to stretch and sometimes they bang their heads on the table. Um, having a new gymnasium would have all that room we could line out, we could stretch. Uh, we, we're looking to have a walking track in our gymnasium so the kids could actually get some cardiovascular in. I am uh, extremely happy that the architect that was chosen is a green architect. She's an expert at what she does and the facilities look like they're going to be uh, absolutely phenomenal. Because the school is a kindergarten through ninth grade right now, we're adding 10th grade next year, and I think the long-term goal is to make it the first and only Adventist academy in the state of Alaska, and we're really excited about that opportunity to serve kids all over the state. I've been praying and I believe that God is going to bless us with a gymnasium by next school year, but to do that, we've got to act quick. Would you be willing to join us, be a partner in our faith adventure and contribute so that we can have a new gymnasium for Amazing Grace Academy by next school year? But we can't do this alone. We need your help. I watched the construction of this church and our school and, and we were all in awe as we, as we saw this building take place. And uh, all of a sudden it's there and it's a reality and we're using it today and what a blessing it is. And I know that the gymnasium will be a blessing too. So. Please help us in this project. We're not mailing letters, so send the video. Help us get the word out about a gymnasium going up in Palmer, Alaska, and follow us on the internet. We need assistance and help from our fellow believers in North America.
I'm going to take you to many of these places during this series. You're going to find them so interesting. Each one has its own separate culture. The southernmost church in Alaska and the very first church is Ketchikan. Welcome to Ketchikan, Alaska, probably one of the most beautiful towns in all of Alaska. It's about 600 miles north of Seattle. Originally, back in the late 1800s, it was just a village, a small native village. It's been built out over the, the water. Most of that town that you can see there is actually on pilings that's out over the water. Ketchikan averages about 200 inches of rain a year. Can you imagine? That's over half an inch a day for every day of the year. In October alone, they get 20 inches of rain, almost an inch a day. It's remote, it's wild. The only way you can get here is either by boat at that ferry dock or by plane. You can see behind me that island. So what you have to do is land at the airport, pay your $5 fee and take a ferry across to the mainland. The principal means of income and the principal industry in Ketchikan is actually fishing and has been for the, the better part of a century. It's here that five beautiful runs of salmon come up through these fjords every summer. And all of these boats that you see out here, many of them are fishing boats that uh, go out and fish salmon. In fact, the one you can see coming in there is just coming in from trolling for king salmon this early. This is where the light was first ignited in Alaska for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In the late 1800s, Ada Sparhawk converted to the Seventh-day Adventist faith under the influence of the teachings she heard in Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan. In 1899, at Fort Wrangell, Alaska, Ada married James Young. She was only married about five years and her husband James died. And so she continued on here as a widow. Her younger brother, Leif, came to help her and they built a second store. Ada's spacious home above the store was where she met with her brother Leif. They built a small area where they could meet as a church. And for the next 10 years, they met in this area, just the two of them. By 1910, they were up to about 10 people attending in that church. And yet they continued to spread the word here and to do literature evangelism and to grow until the first Seventh-day Adventist church was established here in this town. And straight west of Ketchikan on Prince of Wales Island is Craig. We're traveling on the Alaska Marine Highway. We're going from Ketchikan to Prince of Wales Island. We're going to visit the little church in Craig and spend Sabbath with the members there. The sun is just setting and we're beginning another Sabbath. Why don't you come along with us and enjoy Sabbath in Craig on Prince of Wales Island. God used a dream to, to uh, get our Clinton people to join the church. Our people at Lincoln could change or uh, trace their stories back to the great flood of Noah. They have their stories how they went on the high peaks. And back before the first missionaries came to Alaska, we knew there was a trinity. This is my Aunt Bessie who had the dream that somebody who knew was going to teach us to worship on a different day than Sunday. And this is my mother, uh, Maggie, Maggie James. And this is me right there. I want to share with you a fascinating book. Several years ago, we put together a history of Alaska starting in 1896 from the very first pioneer that came here. This book goes through step by step all of the different areas of Alaska. Here in Southeast Alaska, we have pioneer spirits that are amazing individualists. I want you to meet Kurt Welzer. Here in Craig, he has been one of the stalwart leaders in this church for many years. He's a logger, he's a physician's assistant, and uh, he built his own home completely off the grid. You'll enjoy meeting him. I'm the head elder of the Craig Seventh Adventist Church. I live here in Thorn Bay, Alaska. It's quiet. We live in the south arm of the bay. Uh, we just have a few neighbors around. Uh, it's a peaceful place. Uh, we enjoy the outdoor doors. I've been a hunter and a fisherman and a trapper and a uh, commercial fish for a while and uh, abalone dove and uh, uh, I've owned five sawmills since I've been here. And I was a pilot and a nurse and there was no nursing jobs and no pilot jobs on the island at that time. Just a lot of logging going on so I had a big learning curve to, to try to find work and I had uh, seven part-time jobs at uh, one time. A lot of my livelihood before I became a PA and even part-time when I was a, uh, have been a PA has been uh, cutting lumber. I learned a lot of things coming up here and uh, 
Uh, many of the logging uh, skills and things that I didn't know when I came here, I've learned uh, over time. And uh, bought a small mill just to get my house built. I enjoy starting my mornings uh, studying our Seventh-day Adventist Bible lesson studies for the week. Uh, this quarter we're studying glimpses of God. We don't have a Seventh-day Adventist church here in Thorn Bay. There's a couple families that we drive about uh, 45 miles. Uh, it's about an hour and 20 minutes to get to church. It's a beautiful drive, uh, but we're hoping that one day we can have a, a growth of a church here. And actually our church in Craig is uh, quite small. But uh, if anybody out there is interested in coming to a kind of a mission field and uh, helping the work, uh, you'd sure be invited. Uh, right in front of our uh, window here, we see eagles. We have whales come in on occasion. We have otters and seals and all kinds of wildlife and waterfowl. Alaska is a vast state. From the east to the west in Alaska would cover from New York City to Salt Lake City. And yet the population is so sparse. Hi, my name is Ryan Wooler. I'm a pilot here for Bering Air based in Nome, Alaska. This is my office here where uh, they're putting things back together that I've been breaking all day long. If you got a minute later on today, I'd love to show you around. Here we go. We're on our way to Wales to pick up a patient. And as the pilot, I got no idea what's wrong with him. You know, a few years ago, it was kind of a sobering realization as I sat down and, and considered that I've been a Seventh-day Adventist for all my life of 35 years at that point and had never really taken part of introducing anybody to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Steps to Christ, page 80, says that the only way to grow in grace is to share the gospel with people. It doesn't say that a good way is, is to share it, but the only way to grow in grace. And a lot of times uh, we hear amazing stories about people sharing their faith and how well it went, and so I decided to take a step out and, and see how it worked. And honestly, they don't always have good endings. The uh, first time I tried to share my faith with someone, it went miserably, and they went off uh, thinking that Adventists are crazy, which she had good evidence of. But as you continue to share, it changes how you understand the message. I begin to see that Christ is such an integral part of everything we believe. Everything we believe points towards Jesus as our Savior and the grace that he's provided for us. This coming into Wales. 500. 500. That doesn't look warm down there either. Crank it around. It's a combination of feet and uh, power levers. And then the wind usually has uh, some suggestions to go with that too. Pull up. Pull up. We're on the ground here in the village of Wales waiting for passengers, which means lunch break. And we do have a subway in Nome. So we're not all the way off the edge of the earth. Alaska has the highest rate of suicide of anywhere in the nation. And I believe a lot of that lies directly at the feet of the early missionaries who have come and spent so many years explaining to these people that when you die, you go right to heaven. And if you can think about the implications that that has, if you have a friend or a loved one who has died or committed suicide and you're told that they're in heaven, and you're miserable here on this earth with all of the sin that we're surrounded by, why wouldn't you want to go be with them? And we have a lot of suicides that happen in strings because people deeply desire to restore relationships with people that they've lost, and they believe that that'll happen if they kill themselves. The Adventist message, on the other hand, is a huge advantage in explaining to people what the Bible says about what really happens after you die. When you present the truth of God's love and how he died for us on the cross, and what really happens after we die, the true nature of hell, all of these come together in a beautiful solution in stemming this tremendous tide of suicide that we deal with here. I'm May Murphy Seerud, and I would like to sing you a song in Yipik. When you can step outside the door and you can hear a raven squawking, when it's so quiet that you can hear your own heartbeat, and you know that you're really in the wilderness, there's a grandeur, a beauty about it that you can't explain. And so you learn to slow your pace. 
and in slowing your pace, an amazing thing happens. You become more gentle in your spirit. You become more open to listening to other people. You become more receptive to that little voice that speaks in your head when it's quiet. And when the clang and the clash of society die away, that's when you hear God speak to your heart. So there is a beauty in living in these kind of climates and harsh climates. Well, we're off to visit Selwick and Shungnak, two villages up in the in the Arctic. I just want you to come with us and uh, join us in the fun. It's probably 25 below zero, but it's a warm, balmy spring day. Let's go travel in the Arctic, in Kotzebue, Alaska. The ravens are out. We're gonna get on a little 206 and we're gonna fly up the Kobuk River and then we'll just follow the river on up to Shungnak. So here we are at Northwest Aviation. We're gonna just see how how this day progresses. Go out and visit some of the missionaries and see some of the native folks in the villages and bring some encouragement to them. And a little bit of fresh food. We have brought along a few things that they don't normally get in this part of Alaska, so they'll be delighted to get some fresh oranges and a couple of heads of lettuce and a few things like that. We are Kotzebue to Shungnak and return. We've got three going out, three coming back. Five hours fuel will be six hours on the trip. We've got the weather in Notams, and I think that about covers it. Whiskey Bravo, good afternoon. Whiskey Bravo, thanks. Well, I'm here to try to do some, uh, make a contribution before I get old, too old to have an ad adventure. Uh, when you come to Kotzebue, it's a pretty bleak landscape. You wouldn't know that it's an uh, absolute beautiful countryside, a sportsman's paradise, beginning just a few miles away from Kotzebue. All these rivers and frozen land is the Eskimos playground. When I decided to leave uh, conference administration and was looking for an opportunity to do ministry with my gifts of aviation, I looked to northwestern Alaska because I was familiar with it and also there was uh, a lack of uh, charter companies here and the, this particular company, Northwestern Aviation, the owner had uh, retired so that gave us an opportunity to come here and have a source of income to support our ministry. This is the Squirrel River. Tony as a teenager, came to the village of Shungnak probably five or six times for summer ministries, vacation Bible school. So he had a, a fairly realistic idea of what was there. He knew people there already. And Irene is a spunky, adventurous girl. You know, she's a long way from the Philippines, but she is uh, very supportive. The village needed a health aid at that time. It was absolutely the hand of God working in the situation. There's the village of Shungnak, a village of about 350 people. Shungnak traffic, station air 206 Whiskey Bravo is turn final runway Niner, Selawit, uh, Shungnak. Six Whiskey Bravo clearing at uh, Shungnak. Welcome to Shungnak, Alaska, on the edge of the Brook Range, the beautiful Kobuk River flowing by. This is a little village of about 300, and uh, this is our Seventh-day Adventist Church and Parsonage. We're just arriving and we're going in to visit our young missionary couple here, Tony and Eileen Sherman, and their brand new baby, only two months old, born in January. So come with me and let's go in and meet them. I'll take one of those too. <laughs> I can get you, give you one at the airport. Well, welcome to Shungnak. 
Oh, nice to be here. Wonderful. So, did you guys have a good flight? Yes. Good. Wonderful. You live in a winter wonderland. Yeah. Oh, so do you. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, I want to see this baby, this beautiful, beautiful baby. <laughs> Here he is. Oh, you Hi, are so Hi, my name is Hezekiah. Hezekiah. <laughs> you are such a pretty baby. Yes, you are. A brand new Shungnak baby. Yes, you are. We haven't taken him to any of the elders yet to have him uh, initiated. Uh -huh. You know, to oh, give him right. his Inupac name. <laughs> Uh, he knows his papa's voice. Well, this is a lovely little spot. You're all set up. Yeah, we've we've managed to just step by step done every mm -hmm. every little thing that we could to try to get it to uh -huh. get it up to spark, you know. And so, are you happier? Oh yeah. Are we, you? We like it. There's things that are hard, and but uh. Are you both happy here? This is my new home. Wonderful. Glad to hear it. This chapel in Shungnak, Alaska has been pretty much shut down for the last, tw last 25 or 30 years because we haven't had a missionary here. But thankfully, we now have Tony and Irene Sherman. We had waited till October now, I think, to, to come to Shungnak, just when things were getting cold. And I didn't even think about the insulation or the plumbing or really anything. And it was a good thing Jim helped us out and made it all work out for us. But when we got here, Jim dropped us off and came in helped get the, to try to help get the water hooked up, but we couldn't. There were some broken things. And then he said, well, I'll send you the stuff in the mail and see you guys later, Cuddy. You know? And so they left and we were just here and... And I was crying. Irene was pretty oh. freaked out. <laughs> I, was sitting, I was sitting and I was like crying, Tony, how am I going to live here? Look yeah. at this boy. <laughs> So we just stayed in the we stayed in the church for a while for a couple of weeks because it was just easier to keep they had a wood stove over there so we kept it heated. And we're taking a look at the facilities here, the old wood pews, the church hymnals. And with a little help, this building could be worshipped in again. It needs windows, insulation, flooring and people. Ha, cool. Ha, that's great. Finally, we have our pulpit again in Shungnak, Alaska. We haven't made any attempts to plan a time to leave here. We haven't made any any five-year plans or any silly thing like that. Mm -hmm. We have just determined that this is where God wants us to be and we're living here, and as long, as long as, I mean, we like it here, but as long as God wants us to be here, we'll absolutely stay here and we will be happy mm -hmm. to. We have no plans on, we just aren't making any plans anymore. <laughs> we need some more like you. And they're out there. I know there are, yeah. There's more people like that. We just need more young people. I don't know how we're gonna do it, but we're here, and we're just gonna let God use us. After school is out, we usually have a house anywhere from two to six, seven, maybe more, you know, kids that will come over and we play games, we, you know, do fun stuff, we sing, we, you know, just kind of play around a little bit and try to provide an environment that's healthy and uh, safe for kids. And uh, we've noticed that the kids around here, a lot of times they'll watch Irene and me, I've, I've noticed that they watch us, the way we act towards each other, mm -hmm. the way we do things, and I've noticed that. And uh, a lot of the kids that come here, you know, they have parents that are a lot of times not available to them. You know, they should be, but, but they're not for whatever reason. You know, we have, we have about six girls that come over here pretty regularly, and their parents, they're all sisters, and their parents just got thrown in jail three to five years maybe, and uh, all their kids now are pawned off on different people in the village, and that's very, very common. Lots of kids that live with their, you know, their second cousin's 
you know, second uncles or whatever, you know, different mm -hmm. various relatives or grandma and or great great grandma and and so the kids come over here and we try to provide an environment that uh, is spiritual and that uh, we pray and hope every day, you know, that it reflects something that's that's meaningful. But it's uh, mm. it's always fun though. We have some kids over here. I found the address to the prison and I got the kids and they started, I got them on a routine of writing letters to their mom and dad and their dad's been writing them back and, and it's been it's been pretty neat so it's been kind of a cool thing. Nobody here recognizes me as a pastor. Here's the Shungnak Clinic, this is where I work. I'm a health aide here in Shungnak. Uh, what that is basically is it's uh, a doctor's eyes and hands in the small villages here. Doctors live in Kotzebue, I live in Shungnak. I'll see the patient and I'll provide care for them under the supervision of a doctor. I also have to deal with the uh, emergencies that take place and I'm ET, so we have to be ET tra ETT trained and EMT1 and everybody knows me here as Tony the health aide, but there hasn't been a church here in 25 years and that's what God brought us here for. The job helps, but there's a mission. For my Alaska, this has been Ken Crawford. Thanks so much for coming with me. If you enjoyed watching this series, if you're interested in what you've seen or what we're doing in Alaska, go to the Alaska website, alaskaconference.org, and there you'll find additional information.